Father, we thank you for this beautiful afternoon. In the name of Jesus Christ, rebuke and bind every foul, wicked, evil spirit. You can go from here right now in Jesus' name that your word may have free course in the midst of us. And other people say, Amen. Amen. Today I'll share with you from the word of God how God can empower you to harvest the greatest potential in your life by overcoming your natural limitation. Many of us have some kind of a limitation that we kind of feel uh, keep us from our, whatever that God wants us to do. It could be you felt I'm limited by the talents I have. I, I couldn't sing so well like Joy and play the keyboard like Valerie. Or, oh, oh, Pastor, I, I don't have the talent. I don't have the education. Oh, Pastor, I'm too old. I'm too, too young. All right. Oh, Pastor, I've gone through this experience. I had that failure in my life. I don't think I can start life all over again. I just have to condemn myself to live a life of mediocrity. It could be a bondage that you're struggling with. It could be an inherited one. Or it could be something that is environmental. And it's been with you for so many years, the last five, 50 years. But you don't see anywhere that you're able to overcome that big bandage. Today, we'll look at the story of a woman in the Bible that was bent over bondage for 18 years. Can you imagine she walked like this 18 years? I can imagine a woman like that, they're going to be able not to see big vision in life. I don't think she'll be able to see the beautiful sky, the galaxies and the stars. All she can see is going to be the dust on the earth. 18 years. And one day her life was never the same again because she touched Amazing, amazing grace. Hammer must know, one touch of God's favor can cost you increases that you never imagined possible. Rich level they never even dreamed possible. Now before we understand how this particular lady that was bent over for 18 years got that amazing, astounding breakthrough, we had to look at one story uh, that is before this particular event where the lady was healed. I mean, read the Bible with us, always read in its proper context. In the context of this parable that Jesus tells his disciples, and what is a parable? A parable is a picture story that brings out a powerful truth. Very often when Jesus tells a parable, it will be followed by some events that brings out the truth. It was a parable of a vineyard owner, and he did some uncommon thing, unusual thing. He planted fig tree, a fig tree in his vineyard. <laughs> a beautiful picture of God. How many of us God wants to do uncommon things in your life? Somewhere you've got to discover talents you never dream you do have. But God has deposited in it. Don't imagine it, but God wants to do the uncommon thing. Uh, somewhere you've got to discover relationship that uh, God has already installed for you. Pastor, I'm already 72. Can I get married again? Why not? <laughs> the point is that God does uncommon thing. So he planted this victory in the vineyard. So after a few months, uh, he's looking for the fruit. A few years, waited uh, day in, day out. After a few years, there was no fruit. And naturally, he was disappointed. And he's about to chop it out because it's the right thing to do because that pickle fig tree is consuming nutrients that could have been consumed by all the other trees in the vineyard. And how many today are going through perhaps a season in your life that you a little bit disappointed? You planted, you sow seeds, all right, and you did everything you think is the right thing to do, but you're not harvesting the fruit. You're not reaching. You felt the fullness of the potential that God has for you. Now, the greatest treasure in the world today is not in the mine field, the diamond mine field of South Africa. It's not in the rich oil deposit in the Middle East. The greatest treasure in the world today are in all the cemeteries in the world. Lie buried in those cemeteries are songs that have not been written, invention that has not been discovered, business plan that has not been launched, creative ideas that have not been implemented. And sometimes it's because they didn't overcome their natural limitation. It could be a wrong mindset, a wrong thinking, it could be a wrong feeling. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Elijah. God told him, you're 7,000% wrong. This is because he, he listens to this feeling and said to God, God, I'm the only one left, the, the only person left that worship Jehovah God. 
And God said, you're dead wrong. Because there are 7,000 men that ever bowed down to Baal. And Elijah found that he was, his feeling was 7,000% wrong. Something like all kind of wrong feeling can actually rob us of the blessing. Uh, keep us from harvesting the highest potential in our life. Come into the church, get angry because of the Asha never smiled at you. And then you didn't get the Hakka Taufu that didn't reserve for you, upset. And the prophetic word is being released just for you. You miss it. A word that can change your life. It's very pathetic and sad. Sometimes when we're on the verge of the greatest blessing and breakthrough, we miss it. Sometimes good people experience that as well. David. Remember David? He was being anointed king. All right, but he was 17 years of age. It was 24 years later, actually, uh, he was crowned. But that 24 years, he'd gone through much. He was stuck in the backside of the desert for 13 years, smelling nothing but sheep down, goats down. Man, I'm anointed king, but I'm doing it at the backside of the desert 13 years. They don't he was running away from a mad king. One day he was a member in the vicinity of a guy, his name was Nabal. And Nabal insulted David's man. It was like he was about to blow up. He gathered all his men and slaughtered Nabal. When that big girl, his wife, came along and said, Hey, David. You have a great destiny. By the way, Abigail means right thinking, not right feeling. David, you have a great future. Don't jeopardize your future by exploding and yielding to that feeling of anger because you have lost your respect. One moment of explosion can cause you to lose respect that you have earned for the last 66 years. David came to herself you know what? Eventually, he was crowned king. Many people were at the verge of harvesting the greatest brick too, but they lost their destiny. Do you want to look at this particular lady? How she was able to overcome 18 years of bondage. And the owner of this uh, particular vineyard said, let's cut it down. The owner of the vineyard is a picture of the righteousness of God. How many of us know that as a God of all righteousness, he has to deal with sin. Is that a doctor? Look at cancer. He has a go and uh, kill all the cancerous uh, cells. Otherwise, it's going to infect the whole body. So the owner was right. He has to take away the fig tree because it, uh, the fig tree is consuming the valuable nutrients it's going to be used for the vineyard. So he's about to cut. He has to. This is a picture of God. He has to judge, but he does not love to judge. He is a God of righteousness. He has to deal with sin, but he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't love to do it. And then step in the gardener. Let's pick up the story of the gardener of the vineyard and take the passage in the Luke 13, verse 8. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. The gunner is a picture of the grace and the mercy of God. The owner is a picture of the righteousness of God, and he has to, but is in love too. But the gunner came and said, despite the fruitlessness of this particular tree, let me give him special attention. That is the mercy and the kindness of God. When a hundred sheep was around and one sheep got lost, the shepherd go after the one that was lost, giving the one that was lost special attention. When the woman lost one of the 10 coins, the woman leave the 10 coins behind, gave special attention to the coin that was lost. It is a beautiful picture of the grace and the mercy of God. When you make a bad choice, he doesn't just kick you up, cut you down. He has to, he should, but doesn't love to. He likes to come and give you special attention. By giving you, I like that word that is used in the NLT, plenty of fertilizer. Now, what is plenty of fertilizer? What is a fertilizer? Fertilizer is to give nutrient, is to feed. Instead of cutting the tree, wait, I'm going to give that tree special attention. I'm going to give nutrient, 
I'm going to feed that tree. I'm going to supply all the mineral. I'm going to supply all the vitamin that the tree will bear fruit. And the key thing is, how are we going to be able to overcome 18 years perhaps of bondages? The key is to receive that nutrients from God. That's how that lady bound for 18 years, received that breakthrough, was able to do things beyond her natural limitation. Let's see the story, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her, and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. Now, notice the leader was so concerned that Jesus is broken. There's a people who there was a, perhaps the greatest miracle had taken place in the biblical synagogue. But the leader was so absorbed that the Sabbath law was broken. He, he didn't recall that that lady was in his synagogue for 18 years and not having any breakthrough. And she, she was in the synagogue perhaps for 60 years. I can imagine maybe at about 40, he got the disease and now bent over another 18 years, about 60 years of age. 60 years under that so they go, where the laws of Moses was being preached, but there was no breakthrough. But one encounter with Jesus Christ, one encounter with the very epitome of grace. Jesus Christ is overflowing, full of grace. Her life was never the same again. Put it this way, did Jesus break the Sabbath law? Yes, he did break the Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath. But was he guilty? The answer is not. Well, Pastor, how come uh, he, he, he broke the Sabbath and is not guilty? The answer is, Hamra must know that Mosaic law is perfect because it's given by God. But we are in an imperfect situation. And because we're in an imperfect situation, very often, even the best law seems to be conflicting one another. And uh, how many of you remember just a couple of weeks ago, there was a three-year-old boy dropped into a gorilla uh, enclosure, take a look at the picture. And everybody was so tense for the next 10 minutes, the zookeeper was trying to distract the gorilla and get him out of that uh, particular pool, but couldn't. And just about when the gorilla was about to be too rough on the boy, the zookeeper did the unfortunate thing. He raised up the gorilla, but he just shoot the gorilla point blank, killing the, the, the animal that he has been raising for the last so many years. And of course, the whole world was so full of uh, feelings, different, different feelings, whether he should shoot or whether he should uh, not shoot. But if say, did the zookeeper transgress the law against animal killing, especially the protected species? Yes, he, was, he has broken that law. But was he guilty? Let me tell you, he's not. You know why he's not guilty? Because he has done something, obeying a higher law which is protecting the life of the little child. Now, in a perfect situation, the gorilla would not be, the gorilla, would, if it is in a perfect situation, the gorilla would be gentle and playing with the little boy. It would not be rough. Uh, the Bible talks about in the last uh, days, at the time of the millennium, the little boys would play with lion in perfect situation. But this is an imperfect situation. Sometimes, laws conflicts. Uh, just like a, when a, plan, a plane take off. How, how could a plane take off? Because there are two laws operating. One is the law of gravity, they pull the plane down. But there's another law called the law of aerodynamic, which overrule or supersede the law of gravity, broke the law of gravity. And some plane able to break the speed of sound. They call that plane super, supersonic plane. Getting is how could the plane fly? Breaking the law of gravity, because there's another law that superseded. Sometimes in life, in imperfect situation, uh, we have to obey the weightier matters of the law. Jesus talked about it in the passage in uh, Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and cumin, 
and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. How many must know that Jesus Christ, God's Son, tell us they are weightier matters of the law. Now what are the weightiest matters of the law? It says here, justice. What is justice? In the Hebrew, it means the right judgment. Now that when we apply laws, we got to discern sometime in certain particular situation what is the right thing to do. Not just open our big mouth and speak. We've got to pray. This is the reason why we encourage you to practice the 30 second rule. Instead of open your big mouth and blah out whatever they come to your mind, seek God, speak the right word. So you can apply the right judgment, the right judgment, uh, the right discernment, with the right discernment. And then another weightier matter of the law is mercy and kindness. And of course, faith. Faith in the Hebrew also means faithfulness. This is why in the little box in the notes I put down, it is more important to be kind than to be right. So it always, always insists, I'm right. I must be right. Proving ourselves to be right. It's not so important to prove ourselves that we are right. It is more important to be kind. This is why we always remind our ministry secretaries, our ministry oversight, don't be a slave to the implementation of SOPs. SOPs are important, but it's a guide. It's more important to be kind, the law of grace. And uh, so Pastor, I still cannot understand. I know there are weight here methods of the law because they're in perfect situation, but even in the lowest law are broken, we should also be guilty. Well, I think of the story in the Bible where Jesus was walking with his disciples through a grain field. Disciples of the hungry plucked the grain. And then the, the Pharisee look at them and condemn Jesus. They say, how, how can your disciples break the Sabbath law? And uh, Jesus scolded the Pharisees. Did you read the scripture that the priests, when they are ministering on the Sabbath day in the temple, they are not breaking the Sabbath? Then he continue uh, with Matthew 12, verse 7. He says that in Matthew 12, verse 7. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Was the Sabbath broken? Yes. By the disciples? Broken by the disciples? Absolutely. But was it guilty? Jesus declared, no, he's not guilty. See, Pastor, all this is so philosophic, I couldn't understand. Let me tell you, this particular truth is absolutely practical in our everyday life. I'll bring you back to the story. What happened? And there will be a lot of people arguing whether the zookeeper did the right thing, shooting the gorilla. But let's tell you this. Some people say, oh man, no choice law, the zookeeper uh, has to practice the lower of two evil, the lesser of two evil. How many have heard of this? Oh, the lesser of two evil law have to uh, no choice law. The point is that even if it's the lower or the lesser of two evil, it is still evil. So they're saying the zookeeper is still evil. <laughs> it would have saved the boy's life. No, there was no guilt at all in the zookeeper. He did the right thing. He did the weightier matter of the law, which is of saving life. All right? And very often in our everyday life, especially business people, you're faced with day-to-day -day ethical situation whereby <clears throat> sometimes you feel guilty. Well, should I do this? I do that. And the devil wants you to keep you guilty. It's because then he can rob you of the blessing that God has for you. All right? Remember the story of Naaman? Naaman uh, was wonderfully healed of leprosy, and, and he went back to Syria. And before he left for Syria, he told Elijah the prophet, Sir, so I have to, I have no choice. I, I got to take my king to the temple, and he got to lean on me, and I have to bow down to Dagon, the idol of the Syrian king. But Elijah, can I bring some earth from Israel? I'm going to place it in the temple where I'm going to stand. When I do bow down, but my focus is I worship is on Jehovah, the God of Israel. You know what Elijah the prophet said? You burn in hell because you bow down to idol. Did Elijah the prophet say that? No, Elijah said, go in peace. Did he break particular law when he bowed to the Dagon? Yes, he did. He broke the law. But was he guilty? Elijah the prophet said, no. See, in other words, Hamra must know that when we obey the, uh, the way to the matter of the law, we are not guilty. And uh, then the point is, what is the purpose of the law? Well, why did God give us the law then? 
when uh, we're in this imperfect situation, law was given as a mirror to bring us to Christ. James 1.23 For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. How many of you look at a mirror today? <laughs> so now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pimpers. And then suddenly there was a laser beam of like, yum, zoom, zoom, boom, boom, boom. All the eight pimples was gone. <laughs> Could the mirror do that? No, the mirror can't do that. The mirror just show you your scars, your pimples. But can I rectify? You've got to go somewhere. Uh, get your whatever beauty product. A, the law is a mirror to show us where we are wrong. But it doesn't give us the power to overcome that weakness. The law serves as a mirror to show us where we are wrong in order to lead us to Christ. And how many of us know Christ is the key to give us the power to overcome? Galatians 3, 24. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. And we go to Christ, and Christ overflowing with grace. You've got to supply us with the vital nutrient. Remember, plenty of fertilizer. They could give us the nutrient, they could give us the mineral, they could give us the whatever vitamin that is needed for us to grow, to be able to overcome all those bondages, negative traits. Romans of the 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. In other words, when you are under grace, you're going to see that God's power can come in your life to help you overcome all right, the limitation that you can't overcome with your own human ability. And the good thing is, when you come to Christ and receive His grace, you are going to be supply conscious. But if you focus on the law, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. You're going to be demand conscious. And you're going to be feeling miserable all the time. I didn't do this, I didn't do that. But you come to Christ, and your heart is open to receive His grace. Receive that special attention that God giving you, receiving that Plenty of fertilizer. They're going to energize us. As we come to Christ to receive his strength, the Bible says, as we behold him, as we look at him, as we behold him, see Jesus Christ, we're going to be transformed from one level of glory to another level of glory. And and the beginning is to come to him and receive his strength. This will obviously remind all the ministry secretaries and all those involved in particular ministry, Come to church to receive, not to give. So you, you always come, man, I've got to do this, i got to do that. Man, I sacrifice so much, man, that other people are not working, I'm working. You're going to be one horrible servant because you're going to drive people from the house of God with a black face. Sort of bringing them in, all right? Great receivers are great givers. Come to church and even if you miss a service, make sure you get a WhatsApp message from the zone pastor or your ministry oversight, that you keep on receiving. Because when you keep on receiving, that new truth is going to come. You're going to be a great servant of God in the house of God. You're going to be a gatekeeper in the house of God. And all the people say, Amen. Killing is come to Christ. Be supply conscious and not demand conscious. Say supply conscious, supply. not demand conscious. If you come to church always feeling the demand, that means uh, you you got a problem. It's always come, receive, and receive, receive. Like Mary. So pastor, I just sit down. <laughs> no, when you sit down and receive, you will be like Mary, giving the best. Mary was a lady in the Bible that gave that bottle of perfume to Jesus the best. You want to give to the best, you've got to be great receivers. So you're getting this, come and receive. And you're going to overcome whatever things that limit you and you can't overcome in the natural. There was this guy that was struggling with a particular habit, a smoking habit. He just couldn't overcome. And um, he was very troubled. He came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I try very hard, but I can't overcome. And the pastor said, don't try. Huh? Don't try. No, you don't try. Don't try, but I'm going to overcome. Don't try. You can't, but Jesus said, can. Say, I can't, but Jesus can. I don't know how the American would have said it. I can, but Jesus can. <laughs> Say, I can, I can. But, Jesus can. but Jesus can. The key is, come, keep receiving God's grace. And that special attention, that plenteous fertilizer. 
going to empower us to overcome. Maybe you're struggling with a, a trait in your life that you're a very blunt person. You may say you are PR equal zero. PR skill, public relations skill, zero. Pastor, cannot help you. I'm like that, I'm born like that. No, how many of us know? You can receive that grace. Even as you behold him, sit down, not concentrate on doing this, doing that, but receiving. You're fine. You can't, but Jesus can. And all of you say, come to Christ, receive his strength. And that brings us to the next powerful point. Let his kindness supply you with power to overcome those bondages. Luke chapter 13, verse 15. But the Lord replied, You hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies. But all the people rejoice at the wonderful things he did. Now, why do you think that um, the Pharisees are so hard on people, so blunt, so rough, instead of kind with people? And what are the key reasons? Because the Pharisees, their focus is on the Mosaic law, not receiving grace. And Hamra must know that you, you can't really develop good relationship or lasting relationship if you're always hard on people. Proverbs tells us, I'd rather sit on the rooftop eating gua ji than facing a nagging wife. Oh, pastor, I don't know why I'm always talking about lady. You can actually change the word lady or wife to husband. The lady can say, I'd rather sit on the rooftop eating gua ji, xin mui, all right, than facing that nagging husband. I remember, so you can't build good relationships. It's always nagging. This no good, that no good. And the key thing is to, to realize kindness makes a person attractive. Proverbs 19, verse 22. Kindness makes a person attractive. It is better to have little than to be dishonest. See, when you are kind, you've got to be attractive. Not just attractive, you've got to be effective. So kindness makes me attractive, effective. You've got to be a good husband, you've got to be a good wife, you've got to be a business salesperson, you've got to be a good usher, kindness. You're going to be the most effective, you're going to be the most attractive usher when you know what it means to be kind. If you are rough, and some people, are, they, they, they like that, they think they raise their voice, they show black face, get things done. Yeah, you may get things done in the short run. People may avoid you. Most people will not argue back with you. Some they may argue back with you, and that's even better, because at least you know what is the response. Most of the people will not argue back, leave you alone. That's worst. The key thing is, you're not going to be effective servant of the Lord. You lose your respect. The key thing is, kindness makes you effective. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that I ask you to be stupid. Because forgiveness is free, trust is earned. If somebody abuses you, you're not going to bring it to your house. <laughs> All right, I repented before Pastor Elijah. Yeah, that's great, that's wonderful. Trust is earned. Forgiveness is free. It doesn't mean that a guy that cheated you, you bring him back to your business and make him your financial controller. That's stupid. Because how many must know trust is earned. But the kidding is to continue to receive. How are we going to be transformed? The kidding is to receive that fertilizer. And remember, it's plenty of fertilizer. There's going to be abundant grace. The God will shower upon us. Why Judas? was not restored because he rejected grace. He used his own human effort. He killed himself. He could just wait one more day. He would realize someone else would have been hung for him. He doesn't have to hang himself. Self-effort. But Peter received grace. So when you make bad choices, in your little box, in your notes, I put down, number one, don't withdraw yourself from the house of God. Don't deny it. Don't give excuses. You know what? I'm blunt now. My father blunt. Yeah, but now you're a new creation. And other people say, Amen. Amen. So acknowledge your weaknesses. You don't acknowledge your weaknesses to gain forgiveness. You already have been forgiven. 
You acknowledge your weaknesses to know how to overcome, to receive power to overcome. Number one. Number two, flee from tempting situations. Flee. And if you need to be, put restriction in your iPad, if that is your problem. I put restriction in my iPad. Pastor, men of God also need to put men. Why not? The Bible says, no confidence in the flesh. I put restriction in my iPad. That doesn't make me small. It makes it safer, I guess. Because the Bible says, flee. You don't want to put yourself in a vulnerable situation. So number two, flee. Number three, see yourself as precious, valuable in God's eye. How do you determine the value of a thing? I remember my watch. My first watch was Boma. <laughs> it's a Swiss watch, 30 ringgit. I saved many days to get it. But I wore it for more than 10 years. The glass got broken. I put in lamination. Those days cost only 10 cents. You remember those uh, colorful lamination? You can get a pink color one, red color, green color. So we get all the fun of putting different color watch. And then my uh, tangan goes off, hand goes off, and the, the lattice goes off, and, and I stick another thing in with the glue and put it back. My precious watch, but I lost it. If I had it today, how many of you would be prepared to pay 500 ringgit uh, the watch that Pastor Joshua wear? None of you. <laughs> At least one lah. But if I say this watch belongs to David Beckham, 1,000 ringgit, somebody will want to buy. Yeah, I got one hand already. <laughs> if the watch belonged to Brooklyn Beckham, oh man, some young lady, I want to give $500. If I say, hey, this, this watch, huh? Michael Jackson, somebody will say, man, I'm going to pay 1,000 ringgit. Who belongs? God says, despite your bad choices, you still belong to Him. You are precious in His eye. Look at the passage, 1 Corinthians 7, 23. You have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to Him. How many must know you have been purchased at the most, the greatest price, ransom the world has ever seen, the very life of God Himself, the Son of God, infinite value, that means, how many must know in God's eye, you are having infinite value and you belong to Him. You're somebody, despite of what you have done. If you have not done anything wrong, you don't need to have the ransom. It's because if we have done bad things, we need the ransom. So, Pastor, you know, I did this, I did that, you know, I'm ashamed to tell you also. Yeah, exactly, because of those shameful things that we did, Christ paid the greatest ransom. And now you have his value. The value of a product is determined by how much a person is willing to pay. And Christ paid for your life with his own life. That's your value in God's eye is as valuable as Jesus Christ. That's how God looks at you. This is why God says he gives you his righteousness. Look at Romans chapter 5. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. I'm going to know you have the very gift of Christ's righteousness. Well, Pastor, I just feel so dirty. I don't think I have the righteousness of Christ. When you say that, I'm going to know you just insulted God's goodness. Because if I give you a gift, a birthday gift. He said, Pastor, how much? Uh, I'll pay for it. You just insulted my goodness. He said, oh, oh, oh. Pastor, I, I don't feel I'm righteous. I got to fast 40 days. I had to give my tithe first, then I feel righteous. You're depending on self. You just insulted God's goodness. It's not being spiritual when you say, I don't feel worthy. That is an insult to God's goodness. Pastor, I just feel like a jung a junk. I feel like a jerk. I feel like a rubbish bin. You think you're spiritual. You just insulted God's vision. 
You're saying, God, you have cock eye. Can't see. I'm the jerk, you know. You call me righteous. You just insulted his vision. Because God said, you are precious. You have my righteousness. So, Pastor, I don't feel the righteousness. You're just 7,000% wrong because you're feeling. The chances are your feeling is right, is, is wrong, is 7,000%. All right? So, I don't feel I have what it takes. Speak God's word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because the Bible says, Thy word is truth, not thy fact. The fact you may feel you don't have the strength, that is a fact. The fact your IQ may be zero, I don't know. But the truth is, God says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And truth will set you free. Facts won't set you free. Fact like the law, like the mirror, tell you where you are. Facts are like the mirror of the law. That's exactly what we are in the natural. As blunt as can be, as fearful as can be, as judgmental as can be, as rough as can be. The fact is, but the truth, Bible tells us, I have the righteousness of God. When you confess that truth, even when you are surfing the net, even when you are smoking, when you are drinking, indulging all the vices, the fact you are like that. But the truth, you confess it even in the midst of all those practices, I'm the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. The truth that you confess will release the power to set you free. And other people will say, because you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's the reason why it's important for us to know the Bible, read the Bible, hear the word from the manna, spending time in God's presence, receiving His grace to overcome. Other people say, because of what Christ did for us on the cross, we're going to be able to experience that plenty of fertilizer, that grace that energizes us to do things beyond our human ability. God wanted to take you uh, beyond the natural limitation. The beginning is, don't allow those things to come in the way. I'm going to say when people on the verge are going to break through, they give in to their feelings, which are 7,000% wrong. Even the, the thinking. Remember, David almost missed his destiny. On the 23rd year, he would have just slaughtered Nabal. He would have lost respect. And no could to govern the great nation that God called him. Another time in Ziklag, the city was devastated. All the men's children, women, animals were taken out. But the Amalekites came back. The men were in despair. They wanted to stone David. But the Bible said David found strength in the Lord, his God. And receive that supply, receive that grace. Just imagine if David gave up like the man with him, he would have missed his destiny because within 48 hours, he was crowned king. How David was able to fulfill his highest destiny and not limited by his natural feelings that are 7,000 percent wrong is because David received grace. How come Peter was restored? How could Jesus, a right-thinking man, even God of God, would have used guy to deny him? Because they, God knows Peter received grace. When a person receives grace, he will be a great servant of God. He will be a good shepherd. He will administer grace to his sheep because they have gone through a time. And every day he will in the early morning, when the cock crow, he will be reminded he was there because of the grace of God, of the failures in his life. And because he received grace and not giving all kinds of excuses, even though he was imperfect, God can still use him. And God can still entrust the ministry to him because Christ knows a good shepherd must receive grace in order to minister grace. And all of us, every time we take communion, we are receiving grace. You know that God loves you so much, so much, so much. He came down in human form. The 
the Son of God. What does that mean? It simply means the only one in world history that have the very gene of God. He came for one purpose, to take on him, his body, the destructiveness of sin. He hates sin. He loves you. In fact, that he came down. He loves you, but he hates it because he knows that sin can destroy you, your life, your relationship. But he loves you so much, he cannot bear to see you suffering in that destruction that sin caused. He gave up his life. He died. You know why? He loves you. He wants to bear all your burdens, all your misery, all your pain. You say, Pastor, I want to know more about Jesus. I want to receive what He has done. I would love to pray for you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for me on the cross. You took the destruction, the penalty that I deserve, that I may receive. What Jesus Christ deserve? Thank you for loving me so much, willing to die for me. Thank you, for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you have said that prayer and want to know more or have any feedback, please write to us. All the